Mm, now it's the uh, NCHS annual lecture this year given by Martin Rostrup. Um, my name is uh, Andrea Silkose. I am the NCH coordinator. Uh, Professor uh, Martin Rostrup is a senior physician at the Department of Acute Medicine at the Oslo University Hospital at the University of Oslo. He is a specialist in emergency medicine and internal medicine. He has 23 years of experience in medical humanitarian action and has been working with MSF or Doctors Without Borders in numerous war zones, epidemics and natural disasters. He has been working in Africa, in the Middle East, in Asia, in Haiti and in Europe. And he was one of the founders of MSF Norway back in 1996. He has also been the international president of MSF from years 2000 till 2004 and a member of the MSF, uh, MSF's international board. He has also published two books on medical humanitarian action. Please, Martin, take the floor. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come here, actually. And I found this day very, uh, very interesting because um, there were academic reflections of the work where I have been participating for quite some time. But I don't think I took that kind of uh, overview of the activities I've been part of. But um, it also, um, I find interesting that we need to have a kind of critical view of the activities we have been doing. And, and what I'm going to do now, actually, is to... Um, to uh, take you on a journey. It's kind of my own humanitarian journey. And uh, the most focus is uh, as a field medical doctor. And some of the challenges uh, we have faced, but also where we go in the future and what has happened pretty recently. And I will try to come back to some of the discussions previous today because I found them pretty, pretty interesting, actually. But to go really back, it's uh, in uh, Sair in 96. It was called Sair at the time. And we talked about uh, camps. We talked about refugee camps. This is the camps in uh, Goma. Uh, many of you know about this. Here there were people fleeing from Rwanda after the genocide. We knew that people responsible for the genocide, actually, they were hiding in these camps. They were even recruiting young people to fight in the camps. And just to mention some of the dilemmas doing humanitarian action, was it the right thing to do as a humanitarian organization to support a camp in which in the the armed people recruited and tried to build up a new army, where we then complicit actually in arming people and then supporting eventually fighting going on. That's very tricky, because there were needs, of course, in this camp. And this is just one of the dilemmas we have been facing, and as you all, all are aware of. And uh, what happened here was due to disagreements in MSF that uh, one of the sections left and denounced what was going on at the camp, while some other could stay. And that's something you can play on when you have an organization where you have different sections active. But the decision was also taken because we knew that there could be other people taking care of the people. So you could, in fact, leave the camp, denounce what was going on, and say we are not going to be part of it, and then make that statement. But at the same time, it's people, there are people there uh, taking care of uh, the needy. But what happened in autumn uh, 96, when I was sent there actually, was that um, Kabila, the father of the former president, he attacked the camps. And uh, we got a new refugee crisis. Some of you may remember hundreds of thousands of people being moved again, fleeing. And uh, some of them went back to Rwanda as a kind of happy ending story. But we knew when we were there that thousands and thousands of refugees were chased in the rainy forest and massacred. But the world, they just closed their eyes to the destiny of those people. 
And that was very frustrating to be there. And even MSF, we got restrictions. We were not allowed to go into the rainy forest because that was too risky. Some of us, we even thought, we have to go in and witness. We have to talk about what's going on and maybe break out from MSF, <laughs> really going inside. But, but uh, we were not allowed and we didn't really break out. And we could just see the destinies of people. And um, we need, as a few missions, we have been sending trucks on the road to pick up sick people, vulnerable people. And we did actually that. And at the field hospital where I was working, we did triage. We got trucks with patients and we just had to look at each and one of them and, uh, and treat the most sick first, doing a triage, together with Leslie Shanks, a Canadian doctor here. But when I went on this mission, I said, okay, I'm going into a war zone. There, there's a civil war going on and, and um, can I be safe? And I was told very, very clearly, you're going to work in a hospital, that's the safest place you can be in an armed conflict. And I believe that. And also because we based all of our activities on these humanitarian principles, as you all know. Neutrality, don't take any part in the conflict, non-participation directly and indirectly, Impartiality, give uh, aid according to needs, independence from all the powers. And this is increasingly important because as, as we have discussed today, we have state actors financing humanitarian organizations doing operations in areas where they do have some interest. That's not independence. And I will come back to that when it, when it comes to... Um, when it comes to uh, Afghanistan and the general concept of humanity. Just to mention, this little kid had cerebral malaria. He was taken in coma with convulsions from one of the trucks. We kept him five days he was in coma in our field hospital. And then he woke up and uh, he was not affected, had no sequela. And, uh, I was going to send him home, actually, but I kept him and his family a couple of days longer because every morning when I saw him playing around, I saw, you know, it was just a kind of symbol of uh, what we can do. Francis, he was a Congolese nurse. And just to mention, I, as a Norwegian doctor, I had my speciality in internal medicine at the time, but I hadn't seen many kids with malaria. So, you have to be humble in such a situation. I learned a lot from Francis. He had seen hundreds of them. And he was a nurse, he was from Congo, but I learned a lot. That was a digression, but I think it's important in the way we work with our local staff. So, another war, Angola. And uh, I was in Kamakupa, in the really center of Angola, working in a small hospital, and... Uh, taking care of patients. She had tuberculosis. And uh, I also saw the sad part of, of her work. This little kid had cerebral malaria and uh, got brain damage and uh, died within 12 hours after taking the picture. This young man, he was 22 years old. He came on a small truck in coma with convulsions. He had cerebral malaria. He got kidney failure. He got fluid in his lungs. And um, I was trying to, to, to work two days and nights, trying to save his life. And, and I was really, if I had a plane, I could just bring him to my intensive care unit at Oslo University Hospital. We could perhaps have saved his life. But the third night I was sleeping, they woke me up, and I just heard these terrible screams from the hospital, and I knew that he did not survive. But I was in a hospital, we had MPLA, we had a UNITA, they were fighting, but I felt safe, even so. They respected the work we did. So, Afghanistan 2001. And that, then I feel something really changed. And 
we all remember 9-11 and the attacks. And um, the American responded, and NATO responded. There was an alliance. We are going to fight Taliban, we are going to fight Al-Qaeda. So they started a bombing campaign all over Afghanistan, targeting Taliban sites and, and Al-Qaeda sites. And, and really, uh, we had to withdraw of in international stuff. It was not safe to be inside this war zone, which we reluctantly have to do sometimes. But um, then Americans thought, OK, we are bombing, but that's not a gentle act, actually. But to win hearts and minds of the Afghan population, we are also dropping packages of bread and food. So that was the bomb and bread campaign, actually, we started. And when it started, MSF made a very blunt press release in which we condemned the mix of bombing and sending bread packages. We said this was propaganda. How can you go into a territory and you shoot with one hand and you give food with the other? If I go into this area with food, they will think, do I have a concealed weapon? So there was quite some discussions on this. And at this time, I also I was the international president of MSF. So I got very much involved in, in what was happening. We uh, had to write, we had to, to really talk about the situation. There could be a dangerous mix between the political military intervention and the humanitarian action. We have been looking into that before. When I was in Kosovo, we, uh, we, we saw the so-called humanitarian war in Kosovo. Humanitarian war, what kind of concept is that? And I went from uh, Pakistan, I was in 2008, after 9-11. And then um, the interesting thing, making this public statement about American propaganda, which was a kind of advocacy, really strengthened our human or humanitarian diplomacy. Because we had tried for a long time to get in touch with Taliban and negotiate access to, to Afghanistan. After the press release, suddenly they were happy about MSF denouncing the Americans' action. So then suddenly we got access to Taliban. And we had a meeting with the ambassador, the Taliban ambassador in, in Rawalpindi. Later I had a meeting with Taliban in Quetta with the, with the consul in order to try to negotiate access, which we have been discussing previously today, actually. So I never looked at that before as diplomacy, actually. It's, it's a new term for me. But of course, it is a way of talking to people, trying to get access, and also linked to the way you do advocacy. So it's pretty interesting uh, when, I, when I listened to this uh, discussion previously. But when I went into Kandahar in December 2001, just the day after Taliban left Kandahar, we saw a city which you had parts of the city had been bombed, some other parts were not bombed. And um, I was in touch with our Afghan doctors and we started to set up part of the hospital. But then going around in Kandahar, I found out something new. And suddenly we saw this guy. In fact, he's an American soldier. He had almost a concealed weapon in a civilian car. I met groups, paramilitary or former military people. They were doing humanitarian work. So we really saw in the field very clearly how the Americans and the uh, allied forces mixed with so-called humanitarian action. I saw it directly, and uh, when we did explodes into the Helmand province, we were driving in this car, which was white, as you saw the, the other American car in Kandahar. I'm dressed in this uh, west, and we talked to people in Helmand, and this is Michelle, she's um, an American nurse, but still, the people thought we were American soldiers. So, 
it was pretty pretty worrisome what was going on actually. And I remember I had an interview with Washington Post at the time and I said that there are many fights going on in Afghanistan for the time being. One of them is the fight for independent humanitarian action. So we had to address this. Uh, Michel and I, we, uh, we, uh, we wrote an article in The Guardian after being on our mission, identify yourself, because actually the people in NATO, they had attacked or Taliban say you're not identified. But we found American soldiers not identifying themselves. And if you look into this, we see a very clear pattern, very conscious way of thinking. And Colin Powell, he put this together very clearly. He had a meeting with American NGOs. After the meeting, he had a press conference, and then he stated, as I speak, just as surely as over diplomats and military, okay, diplomats, military, American NGOs are out there serving and sacrificing on the front lines of freedom. I'm serious about making sure we have the best relationship with the NGOs who are such a force multiplier for us, such an important part of our combat team. We are all committed to the same singular purpose to help humankind. There you have the doctrine. There you have it really stated. We all work for the common good, for the common humankind, to help it, military, political, humanitarian, we all do it together. This confusion, I think, is part of the problem we face in some conflict zones today. I'll come back to that. Iraq. I was uh, also in, in Iraq during the bombing campaign of George W. Bush. Uh, we sent a small team, six people, I was the medical coordinator, in Baghdad just before the, the, the war started. And uh, we had uh, problems being accepted by the government. To doing the n negotiations, difficult. Why should a small group of people actually be in Baghdad during the war? Uh, that was very hard to accept. But we stayed. And when the bombs were falling, the second night, we went to the biggest hospital in, in uh, Baghdad. And we went to the, to the office of the director of the hospital, and there was a minister of health and a cousin of Saddam Hussein. We heard that Saddam Hussein himself, he was in a neighboring room. And uh, we talked directly to the minister, and we got access to a hospital and we could have our surgical team assisting civilians being injured in that. So we were welcome. But that was a very, very special, uh, very special situation. So we started to work in Al-Kindi Hospital and uh, we got uh, mass casualties. We worked together. This was a bombing of a bus of people coming from Syria, actually, in order to support the fight against the Americans. And we worked in, uh, in the emergency room, and um, we felt actually safe. There were bombing everywhere, but we knew the hospital would not be bombed. Maybe we were naive at that point of time, but uh, still, we were sleeping in a hospital. But we were actually faced another trouble. The Saddam regime, they thought we were spies. And one night, two of our team members were taken by the security police just a few days before the Americans entered Baghdad. It was a very tricky, very diff difficult situation. Because why should we humanitarians be in Baghdad during the war? It's ridiculous, it's risky. And so either we get a huge sum of money, which of course we didn't, or we have to be spies or agents. So very logic. And that's I think a problem we face sometimes is that we as humanitarian actors, people don't really believe the motivation as such, which can be a problem. And I experienced that also in Libya. Chad was another story in which the government forces took control of the area around our hospital, then the opposition forces took, and then it was switching back and forth. But we kept the integrity of the hospital without any problem. That was, uh, was Chad, and we could do other, other surgical operations. But then, I felt there was a change. 
in how conflicts were actually being carried out. In Libya, I had contacts with, uh, with doctors in, uh, in, in Suvara uh, when they were attacked. I was in Tunisia. We wanted really to go into Libya and start working in Libya. The Gaddafi government said no. We don't want any international NGOs here. ICRC, they had access to, uh, to Tripoli. They were there, accepted. MSF was not welcome. But we talked to doctors that told about needs, especially in this area, Sintan, Garian, and uh, we wanted to go to this area. But then we had to pass through, actually, the border, which was controlled by Gaddafi. And it's becomes so difficult now that actually we have to smuggle I was smuggled together with another one to test the route. We were, we, we, we were working together with the smugglers in order to get access to the war zone and, and the opposition controlled territory because we were not really accepted as independent humanitarians. And why? Because MSF was viewed as a Western, as we have discussed previously today, a Western organization, and thereby we were part of the alliance. And NATO was bombing, and uh, they really firmly believed that we were part of this kind of coalition, this force multiplier, as uh, Colin Powell talked about. You know, when that concept gets roots, it's becoming difficult because people will always think about. NGOs as part of a military political strategy. But we managed to smuggle people in. I set up an intensive care unit. We were treating really injured people. And uh, many of these have uniforms, but they were actually students that uh, started to fight and got recruited voluntarily to fight the Gaddafi. It was a really very very tricky situation, and we worked pretty hard. This was a young guy, and he got this scrapnel here through his stomach, and, uh, and a lot of bleeding, but uh, we managed to save his life, and <laughs> paradoxically, we had, in fact, to smuggle him to Tunisia for more advanced surgery, because we couldn't do e anything, you know, everything in this, this small hospital. This is uh, actually... Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I have to skip it, but um, this is from another thing we did. Misrata was surrounded by Gaddafi forces, and it was piling up with a lot of wounded people in the hospitals. So we arranged evacuation by boat into the harbor of Misrata, which was often under attack. But we managed to go there, and we brought 300 patients many very severely uh, wounded, and we brought them to Tunisia. And then we could lessen the burden of the hospital, of hospitals in, Mis in uh, Misurata. So I went back from the boat trips, I went back to Sintan, and in my, May, we uh, got attacks, attacked. Then the Gaddafi forces, they deliberately, they sent rockets to the hospital. They just ended uh, very few meters from where we were. And uh, this is uh, actually uh, a neighbor, uh, just 150 meters uh, from, uh, from the hospital. One of the, the, the rockets hit. So after three days and all the attacks on the hospital, we had to evacuate our team. So... I talked to other doctors there. They said that blood banks had been destroyed, ambulances, and I saw it myself, were shot at. Even people carrying the wounded into hospitals were shot by snipers. So it was obvious to me at the time that we now have a new kind of warfare, not very new maybe, or a recurrence, and that denial of health care is used as a weapon of war. And that brings me to, to my last point, and that is Syria. I was also working there. Partly, in fact, we tried to get in, and this was 2012, in the Kurdish areas, because we were told that actually the Kurds were controlling this, so we could 
get enough security. Once more, MSF was not accepted by the Bashar Assad regime. We were not allowed to go to the government-controlled territories. Once more, we were, I suspect, looked upon as part of a Western alliance, even though we were not. But that's the perception. Another thing is that we support everywhere where there are needs. And that was also in opposition-controlled territories. And in fact, we were welcome in these territories. So um, we were not sure in the Kurdish, because we have never been there, and uh, we went there undercover in order to see, look at the needs. And um, we managed to come to Kamishli, but we had to hide because there were Syrian security forces around. So there was no way we could operate uh, as, as international staff in such a war zone. And in this city, I had meetings with the 10 Syrian doctors, and I, I heard what's going on. And they said that it's so difficult now. If I'm caught treating a patient that could be part of the opposition, I could get arrested, even tortured and killed. The logic now was, if you treat my enemy, you become my enemy. So difficult. They did things in secrecy, in basements, on kitchens. It was a desperate situation. It was illegal to treat patients. It's really opposing all we know about medical ethics and what humanitarian action should be about. And this has been now systematically going on. We, I went back to Syria through Turkey. We made a school to a small hospital. I was working here. Together with Muhammad was a Syrian doctor. It's really fascinating on these missions when you really work with people from all kind of countries, but especially the local people, as Muhammad. He was an incredible 28 years old doctor, and he called me one night because he had a young woman who was about to die. So she's dying, she's dying, she said. And I, I came to the hospital to assist, and uh, it was this young woman with pulmonary edema, water fluid in her lungs. That's not normal for a 22-year-old woman. But she had kidney failure, she was de dependent on dialysis, and there was no way of doing this in, uh, in this war zone. And we forget about that. A lot of people with chronic diseases, diabetes, with asthma, with, uh, with um, different kinds of heart disease, with epilepsy and so on, they don't get the treatment they're used to. They are the other victims of this kind of warfare. A warfare where you really deliberately attack healthcare structures. Muhammad, he was, uh, after I left my mission, he was taken by ISIS, tortured and killed. Terrible when I heard about that, because he was such a great, great doctor. And he was one of the victims. So being a doctor in a conflict zone, it's getting more and more difficult. When I went into Syria the first time, I was told, if, if I get caught, don't say you are a doctor. You can say you are a journalist, or m even better, an engineer. And that's the first time I've really been in a conflict zone where it's dangerous to be a doctor. And it's still dangerous for Bajar, who has been working in this hospital ever since. And uh, I talked to him on Skype some time ago, and also some of his colleagues, and they said that, yeah, when I go to work, I'm just scared, afraid of being attacked. And when we look at the statistics, in this 30 years, we did some assessments. There were 14 attacks on MSF hospitals. But we've seen just these years, there's been a tremendous increase. And everybody is actually looking into this now. This is from the Lancet about the weaponization of, of, of healthcare. And we see how starvation deliberately also is used as a weapon, weapon of war. And Physicians for Human Rights, they have a statistics here of all the attacks on health structures in Syria. 
And when we look at it, from 2011 to 2019, there is 300, which they say is Syrian government forces and Russian forces, etc. 583. And almost 1,000 medical personnel has been killed. This is the reality. Amnesty International did a survey north of Aleppo, and there was this hospital being attacked. And in this hospital was this guy. He was the only pediatrician, and he was killed in that attack. Three years ago, this hospital in Afghanistan, in Kunduz, a huge hospital, MSF hospital, was attacked by American forces. They bombed it. More than 40 people were killed, many more were injured. This is how the operational theater looks like after this terrible attack. The Americans said they were responsible for the attack. They said there were a lot of mistakes being done, but we insisted on an international commission to investigate what was going on. No way. No, it never happened. It was the Americans themselves doing the investigation, and then that's it. So we really, really attacked this. There are systems in the, in the UN, this fact-finding commission, that can be mobilized to look into the facts when it comes to possible war crimes. It's never been activated. And in the Security Council, they condemn, condemn, condemn resolutions about attacks on hospital, but they continue. There is an impunity, and now, last week, we made a press release because our hospitals have been attacked in Yemen. We have seen it other places as well. And there was a joint incidents assessment team, so UK and USA supported, to look into a hospital which killed some people, and we wanted to see the results. It seems that they found out that this, uh, this bomb, there was some technical mistake with the bomb. So that was the reason. So when you put those people to really look into what's happening, then um, you will not get the truth, in my opinion. And we don't know for sure what really happened in Kundis either. So to, to, in the end, is independent humanitarian medical action possible? Very difficult, for one reason that we may be perceived as part of alliances. We see politicians and alliances co-opting humanitarian actors in order to win hearts and minds, and we have this kind of confusion. The second point that makes this very difficult is that there is a deliberate attack on healthcare structures as part of a war strategy. They bomb markets, they bomb schools, they bomb uh, um, bakeries, they bomb hospitals, destroy the infrastructure. That's the warfare we see very clearly, as seen now in Syria. So it's getting tough, it's getting difficult. We are still trying, trying, and, and hope it will be possible to do more because the ones suffering are the civilian population. Thank you. Would you like uh, to join on stage? So, uh, Thea Hilors is uh, our discussion. She's a professor of humanitarian studies at the International Institute of Social Studies, or ISS, of the Erasmus University in The Hague. She's also a PRIO Global Fellow, and I was lucky enough to have uh, Thea as uh, my professor at the uh, LSE, so I know uh, she'll share some excellent insights on uh, humanitarian principles and perhaps access as well. Um, hi, everybody. Is this... Yeah, is it working? Oh, interesting. You don't hear it from here. Um, thanks a lot for this uh, really great presentation. I, I was, you know, spellbound, like I'm sure all of you were. And it feels a bit... Um, almost weird to then come up with a comment after a story like this, which stands on itself. And for me, it's the real deal when I hear you speak about what you actually encounter in, in, in real life, in real operations, is super interesting. And um, 
so I will also try to be a bit brief. Um, I recognize what you're saying completely, and I think some people have been writing about this, the whole instrumentalization of, of, of aid, the, um, the loss of independence that is, you know, ascribed to you or perhaps even real, and this whole idea that um, healthcare is used as a weapon of war, so is food, of course. We see that quite often, starvation, you mentioned it. And uh, this whole idea, when you treat my enemy, you are my enemy. Now, what I'd just like to add, perhaps as another layer, in yet another layer in this conversation, is to pick up from what Sultan started this morning. And that is how all this fits, or even is made worse, through counter-terrorism measures. So what you're talking about is really on the ground, the dynamics of armed forces, the dynamics of warfare, but parallel to it, and I'm sure you're aware of it, is the uh, layer where um, donors and donor countries take counter-terrorist measures and how that plays into these realities and actually makes it even worse, I think. And, and you probably recognize it. So the, uh, especially after 911, we have seen uh, an, an, a huge upsurge of counter-terrorist measures. And for example, in 2011, when the drought, the worst drought in the Horn of Africa was happening for 70 years, it was a very amazing situation because the drought in Ethiopia and Kenya, the responses were so good by the government com together with the international community and that is actually something to celebrate, that there were no excess deaths, even though it was such a terrible drought. So nobody died more than they would have died in, this no, in a non-drought situation. In Somalia, however, we saw, I think, 350,000 people who died. The count is, is never really clear. And that was partly on account of the warfare and the war dynamics and the role of Al-Shabaab. But also, and here comes the work of Dan Maxwell, it had a lot to do with counter-terrorism measures. That was uh, regulations that would forbid anybody to be seen helping a terrorist group. And seen helping a terrorist group could also just mean negotiating access would already be considered helping a terrorist group. It would also mean that banks were so afraid that they were seen to help a terrorist group that they would what they call de-risk and refuse to transfer money to agencies working in particular areas. Now, in Somalia, it was, of course, a terrible, terrible uh, idea that perhaps and, and, and real people died massively on account of these measures. So there has also been some evaluations of those measures, etc., etc. But interestingly, and um, that's why I also like to mention it now, the Norwegian Refugee Council just came out with a new report, again, about this issue, and it shows that nothing much has changed. Oh. Actually, things are getting a bit worse again. And that is now also the case in the Netherlands, and that's why I'm, I'm sort of on top of this at the moment, because what we see now is that first, what Sultan already mentioned this morning, it's super important, the, when, when, an, when an organization is labeled or branded as a terrorist, you don't actually know why. I mean, what makes it an organization a terrorist organization? It's not even clear. There's no clear definition. But what we do know is that once an organization is branded as a terrorist organization, they're not considered a party of war. So they are not also under international humanitarian law considered a party of war. And hence they are out of uh, sort of the kind of party you can bring into negotiation. So you're not supposed to talk with them. You cannot negotiate with them. And you can also not negotiate about healthcare and about stuff that is going on. So it makes it for humanitarian agencies practically impossible to work in certain areas. Now what we now see in the latest fashion of this type of legislation, counter-terrorist legislation, uh, is that there is a shift from branding organizations, which is already sort of, you know, rather vague, when can you, and, and of course politicized, I mean, when there is a, a government and there is some anti-government armed action, you just say they are terrorists. They, they don't talk about rebels anymore or whatever, but it's uh, the communist rebels. No, it's terrorist, terrorist, terrorist. So that is one thing, and it doesn't help with finding political solutions. But even then we see now a shift happening where 
shifting from branding organization as terrorist to areas that are considered terrorist. So rather than saying there is this organization that is a terrorist organization, there's a speech of in this area where supposedly a terrorist organization is more powerful and, and, and ruling, you're not allowed to be there anymore. So we now see lo legislation coming up in the UK and now in the Netherlands where it actually says that nobody is allowed to go to particular areas that are branded as terrorist areas. So not terrorist organizations, but terrorist areas, which plays directly in what you're saying, this whole idea that helping out our enemy, and of course terrorists are you know, enemies without even talking further about it. Once an organization is labeled a terrorist, they're, they're not even an enemy. They're beyond enemy. They're the devil themselves, more or less. So from branding those organizations, it's branding areas, no matter who is living there, civilians and whoever, and you're just not allowed to be in that area unless with special permission. Now, some of those laws, they make exemptions for humanitarian agencies, but many don't. So what we now have in the Netherlands, they don't want to make an exemption for humanitarian agencies. And there's, of course, another difficulty here, which is undeniable too, that many of the people who went to Syria to, to be with uh, IS, probably to fight, they now say, no, 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 we were just there for humanitarian purposes. So it's also true that quite a lot of people try to take on the identity of humanitarians so that, that governments now say, okay, just you proclaiming that you're a humanitarian doesn't exempt you. But then it shouldn't be too difficult to make an ex to make an exemption for recognized agencies like MSF and other agencies that are registered and, and also receive government funding, why they shouldn't be allowed and enabled to do work in those areas. So it's not a comment on what you're saying, it's just adding another layer yet again. And I think we haven't seen the last of it there was for a little while the idea that those counter-terrorist measures were going to be slightly softened, especially after the lessons from Somalia. But now what the Norwegian Refugee Council shows, it's actually getting slightly worse. And also, again, adding another layer to make it even more difficult to do humanitarian aid and, and provide health care to areas that are considered as an area to be a terrorist. So it's just yet another layer of bad news of why it is getting increasingly difficult. And also just to go back to the very first uh, panel we had this morning, for me it, it also shows how important it continues to be that we step up diplomacy and advocacy around these kind of issues. This morning, I don't know if some of you were in the room, I already made an intervention about the criminalization of aid, even here in Europe, where we now see people arrested for giving just to take a hitchhiker who is a migrant and you can get arrested for that in Denmark, I think. People in Italy that are being fined, ridiculous fines for just passing on a glass of water to a migrant. So the criminalization of aid, and I, I mean, we can't just put everything in the same pot, you know, the counter-terrorism measures and the criminalization of aid. But then if you add up all those different stories, it's very clear that the very notion of humanitarian aid, the very notion of the principle of humanity, that on account of being a human being, we find it important to save your life. That very notion seems to be going increasingly down the drain. And that's where I feel it's just not a time to be very picky about who is doing diplomacy and who is doing advocacy and why and what counts and what not. And, and I think it's a time to sort of connect the dots more effectively and, and, and be sort of more engaging in these kind of things unitedly. I find it, for example, a big pity that the big humanitarian agencies don't collaborate strongly with human, uh, human rights organizations in the, in the European context where they have similar messages but don't seem to want to work together. And I always wonder, is that really smart or is it just simple pedigree history? Of course we don't work with humanitarians and is there maybe you know, a shadow they should step over? Okay, I think that's it what I can contribute. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just comment a bit? Uh, because um, I totally agree. And uh, I see this as a big problem as well. And 
in 2001, something changed because you got the war on terror and you got the whole concept of, 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 of terrorism. And uh, we have been facing this very clearly in the field. And uh, to take Somalia, for instance, to get access to Al-Shabaab controlled territories, we had to negotiate, back to negotiate, uh, with Al-Shabaab, who was, uh, or and is, you know, viewed upon as, as a terrorist organization. And we faced the dilemma that we pay salary to the people working in Al-Shabaab controlled territory, and they have to pay taxes mm. to Al-Shabaab. So we are actually giving money to a terrorist organization in order to assist the civilian population there. And that's just one of those dilemmas we do face, and which choices, very difficult choices we have to, have to make. And we were doing operations there until uh, we uh, got two uh, Spanish aid workers uh, kidnapped for 22 months. And it was really uh, a very sad story, but they, they survived and they were taken care of afterwards. But uh, anyway, we saw that the people we had been negotiating with, they were complicit in the abduction of the people. Then, you know, we cannot accept to be present under such circumstances. But I would also say that Part of this happened before we got the war on terror. When I was in Sierra Leone in, in, back in 2001, RUF, a guerrilla movement or opposition forces, they control quite some territory. And the UN system said, we are not going to give aid to this because then we will uh, legitimize mm. this as a group. When I was in Angola in 2002, end of the civil war, UN refused to give food aid to UNITA-controlled or former UNITA-controlled territories because UN wanted to play a political role in the, fee, in, the, in the peace process. And we did an analysis. I even had a meeting with Kofi Annan at the time in order to address how UN, in our opinion, failed. So much of these political considerations have been going on at a bit smaller scale maybe before, but as you said on war on terror, uh, it has been used to justify almost everything you do in a, in a war zone. And uh, as we see with Turkey now, uh, the Kurdish terrorists, etc., etc. So um, how to move from here? Mm. You know, to, to, to reestablish a respect for independent humanitarian action in this landscape? I don't see really how we can make it, but I hope we will, because the civilians are suffering. Thank you very much, uh, both of you, actually, for your uh, presentation, your comments. Uh, I, I mean, historically, it's not the first time that hospitals have been bombed. I mean, the, my government, the Italian government, bombed uh, hospitals in Ethiopia back in the 1930s. So uh, I, I think if you look at, take a long historical uh, look at this, I think the question for me is, what has happened uh, is it 9-11 and the counterterrorism agenda that has changed the parameters that make it now more acceptable for f four of the five permanent members of the Security Council uh, to bomb hospitals, as Joanne Liu said when she addressed the Security Council? So that's one issue. So I is there a, uh, a quantum or a qualitative change? The second issue that I want to raise is about accountability. And uh, I think we've been collectively weak on accountability. The ICRC collects information, but of course doesn't share it. Uh, you try to activate the fact-finding mission. Of course, it was not going to go anywhere because you needed the support of the US government and the Afghan government, who were both complicit in what happened. So my question is, why didn't you try to have a credible international um, investigation with you know, credible people from a team of people from around the world who would, you know, there was a lot of information on what happened in Kunduz. And I think there was a lost opportunity there to, you know, you could have done more, I think, to increase the reputational damage for those who bombed you. Would you prefer to 
Well, yeah, yeah. When it, when it comes to Kunduz, uh, I think it could be in a way a good idea, but to get access to all the information, to uh, get access to what actually happened, I think would be very difficult. Since the U.S. and and the Afghan, they refused any more investigation into this. But how to form that group and how it could get access to all the information without any formal mandate uh, supported by the UN, I don't know. Maybe it could have been done, but um, I haven't heard about this being done before. That doesn't say that we cannot do it. But um, to have a mechanism, because for the time being there is impunity now. And, and I agree there has been hos hospitals bombed before, but now it seems to be very systematic and it's state actors actually doing this, you know, deliberately as, as a kind of warfare. And uh, I've seen, you know, the trend from, from the 20 years I've been, you know, working that something is going on now. The reasons why, you know, I'm just speculating some possible uh, explanations here. Yeah. Thank you so much for both of you for interesting discussion and reflections from, from both sides of the coin, so to say, from the practitioner perspectives and then some theoretical and academic analysis of the situation as well. What, and what I found interesting when you said that humanitarian diplomacy is, diplomacy is a new concept for, for you, and you kind of pointed out these negotiation bits from another perspective perhaps, I'd like to pose the question to you that do you see yourself as a humanitarian diplomat? And if yes or no, and why? Well, as you defined it, I have been a humanitarian diplomat as well as I've been doing negotiations. I've been uh, in many situations where I've been kind of doing di diplomacy to change treatment, for instance. Burundi, back in 2002, we pushed the Minister of Health uh, very clearly and uh, even had a meeting with the, with the, with the president in order to, to, uh, to change protocols. And we also worked through the WHO, where Gru Hallam Brundtland was, uh, was director at the time. And we managed, in fact, to change the whole treatment in Burundi and later the whole of Africa. That was a kind of diplomacy, you could say. But I never used that word, and I n never looked upon me as a diplomat. Uh, you some can use another word. Well, it's um, what you say. You are uh, also a messenger in a way. You 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 try to lobby. Uh, that's another expression. Or you try to 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 talk to people of power and try to uh, get a change to provoke a political change. And this we do partly as uh, as of advocacy as well. And it's very much linked. So what's purely advocacy and what is purely diplomatic? I don't know. I I think I've been doing everything without labeling them in such and such way. So that was new to me. But if you look at my actions, I, uh, I suppose I've been a diplomat as you defined it. Of course, I mean, MSF is the organization that really introduced advocacy in the field through the témoignage. Yeah, and, and yeah. Where you use international humanitarian law as your basis to actually step out and witness yeah. and do advocacy. Yeah. No, it was because we don't want to do pure charity. You can go into a war zone, you can go into a natural disaster, and you can give perfect medical aid, mm -hmm. and you can shut up. But when we see what we see, we want to speak about it in order to provoke political change. But we cannot present the political solutions, because always again, yeah, what can we do? It's not our competence to do that, but, but it's really challenging the politicians or whoever is in power. Yeah, um, I was very clear in, in, in the journey you described that there, there are two things uh, that uh, emerge clearly. One is this blurring of boundaries between different actors and, and, and uh, protagonists in, in, in war zones. Uh, and this, of course, the more you, it, it's difficult to distinguish between, between actors, uh, uh, the more some that used to not to be exposed, they will be exposed to war violence, right? Um, the point is that uh, the blurring of boundaries uh, is an effect of the, of, uh, of the fact that it, it is difficult in reality to distinguish because uh, uh, soldiers, as, as we say today, have been conducted uh, missions with humanitarian mandates. Uh, there have been uh, concrete you know, overlapping of uh, humanitarian goals and military goals. And uh, s um, then we also discussed about the role of private, uh, private actors and so on. So this is one dimension. 
The other one is uh, the, the shift strategies within war. And, uh, and of course, I mean, uh, to, to this ranges from, for example, targeting uh, hospitals or the food chain to impede that food is moved towards some war areas to the dronification, what someone has called the dronification of war, mm -hmm. uh, the, the creation of this uh, target killing, um, list of target killings and so on. So there are these kind of shifts and, and, and transformations in the way war is conducted. So uh, considering these um, two uh, dimensions that, uh, you know, overdetermine the war now um, and, the, and the work that is possible to, to do in war zones, so do you really think that the point then is to try to distinguish some humanitarian agencies or actors from the rest? So is independence really what is at stake here or rather a radical different understanding of uh, you know, the role of uh, humanitarianism in a broader sense in, uh, in determining these uh, phenomena and so maybe also with some auto-reflexivity, the role uh, of humanitarian actors themselves, mm. uh, you know, in this kind of evolutions. I think um, what has happened is part of this blurring, of course, and I think that NGOs have been complicit in some of this blurring as well, because, um, and that we discussed about state actors, and NGOs may be uh, contracted, by state actors. We uh, saw clearly in Afghanistan, you know, you see everywhere. And I asked even Norwegian Red Cross that was mostly financed by the Norwegian government and they did operations, humanitarian, independent, neutral operations in Afghanistan. And of course, Taliban, they know all about finances. You can just go on the internet and find out. So if you meet Taliban and you said, no, we are neutral, we are not taking part in this conflict, and they say, but my enemy is financing your operations. How can you see that you are not part of the operation? Which, uh, which says that, yeah, we, 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 we do face problems also of, of the behavior and the dependence of the humanitarian organization to state actors. And even there are NGOs taking part in conflicts. We have, uh, we have the Norwegian People's Aid NPA in Norway, who supported, actually stated, SPLA in South Sudan. And that was very clear. It was a political act, and they also called it humanitarian. So you do find, uh, you do find it. Distinguishing, when I was in the board of MSF and also the president, I, I was really trying to focus. Could we at least try to isolate MSF from the rest of the NGOs and the UN system. As ICRC has been pretty clear, you know, they have the mandate and they have been positioning themselves more clearly. And uh, so everybody says MSF is something different from the other ones. We have, we have failed to do that. And I don't know how eager we have been to, to, to accomplish that, but, but really I think that's, that's important. If you're going to change the perception I don't know if you have, you know, now it's gone too far. I don't know. Uh, to reverse things, I don't know. Well, maybe not from today or tomorrow, because um, I think what you mentioned, blurring of boundaries, actors and strategies of war, that still has a rationality to it. But what I feel is changing underneath that is how to look at the value of life. I, I, I remember the first time I heard somebody trying to negotiate access and that the person that, that, that you know, they, they had to ask access from was simply saying that their, their argument was, of course, yeah, we need to go there because these people are perishing. And that he would answer, oh, what do I care? Let them perish. But that was within a war zone. But we see that now increasingly getting outside and beyond war zones, especially, and, and as well in the countries where... We're, that that were not like that. I mean, I'm from the Netherlands. We're supposed to be a rather one of one of the better guys in 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 the world. But now, the whole notion of civilian seems to be gone. We are seriously talking in our parliament about toddlers of two years old. 
that can't come back to the Netherlands because they are considered a potential future terrorist threat. Because they say, well, if you were born in an IS area, if you now come to the Netherlands, it's too much of a risk that they, these kids, they are just like this size, more or less, at the moment, they will grow up to become a terrorist. So the whole notion of civilian and, and hence of the value of life I mean, the number of people in the Netherlands, and I'm sorry that I keep banging on the Netherlands, but it, we used to be, as I say, one of the countries that was known for a more tolerant attitude. But if you if you ask around now, how many people say, well, shouldn't have been born in Africa, let them drown, their own fault to be. So that that is an underlying notion that I feel is is changing in many parts of the world. That is that asks from all of us to retain some level of vigilance and, 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 and trying to push back. And it won't, we won't succeed from today or tomorrow, I'm afraid. But it will be great if we can at least keep alive some of the ideas for when the times are better. Mm. Mm. Can I have one final question from Africa? Yes, thank you so much. I'm a great fan of what MSF does. And uh, in that spirit, I would like to ask you as to how you actually take decisions as to where you intervene, how you intervene, when, and uh, more importantly, when do you withdraw? Mm. Because MSF have developed this reputation, uh, which is now probably talked about widely in the sector, of being a little bit special. Some will say erratic. Some will say too nervous. Mm. Some will say they have a very strange level of tolerance, sometimes really, really very high, and sometimes a small incident will drive the whole mission out of the country. Mm. But when you describe things like you went into Libya being smuggled illegally, you've already broken one of the laws by attempting to go in, regardless of how useful that would have been to the Libyans and what the size of the team and so on. Mm. The same with Iraq. Do you not think you put yourself and others at risk by attempting to break in uninvited or uncoordinated? And that links to the whole uh, discussion around, um, around coordination. MSF is often missing in those circles. Uh, we were all very surprised when they withdrew from the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016. And I don't blame you for that. I think it was a logical thing to do then. Mm. But there were things like um, there are opportunities, say, for example, with the Red Cross, Red Crescent. In every country, there is a Red Cross, Red Crescent society, and there is openings, particularly in health for you to establish uh, a legal entry point, uh, to have a little bit of presence in a hospital and build onto it. And then linked to that is the issue of, of responsibility to the people you work with, the people you leave behind. And you mm. clearly have been moved by the ones that lost, lost their life after you left. And it's something that we often blame the Americans for doing, that they take people as uh, assistants, uh, translators, they become associated with their mission, then they leave the country and they leave them behind. Is there a system within MSF, and I, maybe this is a general question to everyone, as to what do you do with these local that, mm -hmm. that have worked with you and have become tainted by the international uh, color, whether they like it uh, uh, or not? And, and I'm just in intrigued whether those decisions are made individually or like groups or the board sits and debates these at various levels, <sighs> ethically, uh, legally, uh, with a bit of uh, future you know, perspective on this. And my last question, are you f aware and have they interviewed you the uh, Lancet Commission on Syria? Have they interviewed you? What? The Lancet Commission. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about that, yeah. You. Were you interviewed? No. Well, I think you should be. I, yeah. uh, it's, uh, I just want to add, although these are complex and yeah. complicated questions, please keep your answers. Yeah, I will, Sorry. I will try to, to, um, to be very quick on this, but it's very important issues to raise. Eh? I can talk long on this point, but when it comes to our assessments, explore missions, to see if we have a humanitarian space, if we can really find what kind of needs, if we can give the assistance satisfactory, and if we can monitor the effect of the assistance. As you know, this is the humanitarian space. And then we have to negotiate with whoever is in control of that, of that area. Uh, and we need to be accepted. Uh, the problem now in North Syria was that um, we didn't manage to get 
the necessarily acceptance from all the warring parties to operate in in the Kurdish areas anymore. So we had to take our team out. But as you said, the people being left behind because they cannot move out, they get as much support as possible. You know, at least in a hospitals, clinics, they get medicines and so on. The psychological support will be something else because then you have to bring 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 other resources to it. So um, sorry, you continue to supply a hospital after you leave it. Yes. Okay. And uh, in Syria, for instance, we had to evacuate several times, and we have been supporting hospitals with medicines and drugs and equipment for a long, long time, which is not the ideal way of doing. It's a kind of remote management, which we don't really like. But we do that also now in in northeast Syria. Yeah, uh, we can discuss a little bit later the other points as well. Yeah. No, I think the. I mean, there were really obviously questions for MSF, so it's mm -hmm. fine. Yeah. And just uh, a very quick final remark. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, keep up with the NCHS activities on our uh, website and the Core Institute website. That's Prio, Nufi, and CMI. Um, don't be a stranger. We would love to uh, collaborate and uh, perhaps help you disseminate some of your research and some of your work. And uh, please join us for refreshments out in the hallway. Thanks. Thank you. That was very nice. Thanks so much. Really nice.